Our 2024 preseason top 10, Georgia and Notre Dame get bad news, plus other news and updates from across college football after the stinger. Hello and welcome to episode 27 of Good Morning College Football. I'm Nicholas Ian Allen from CFB Winning Edge and CampusToCanton.com. Thank you for joining us this morning. And of course, thank you for uh, subscribing to the Campus to Canton YouTube channel, giving this video a like. We very much appreciate that. And it certainly helps uh, as we continue to uh, work on this show, bringing it to you three days a week for uh, at least the next six months or so. And then we'll probably reevaluate uh, the schedule as we are uh, hoping to, to publish our 2024 CFB Winning Edge, C2C Winning Edge team profiles uh, by... May 1st. That's our, our target date right now. And that is something that we're going to spend a, a good chunk of our opening uh, segment discussing as uh, we're working through that process. And, you know, the, the early stages of it uh, are always a little bit slow, but it really starts to pick up steam uh, in the, you know, uh, last month or so leading up to uh, publishing. But uh, we do, as of uh, this morning, have a pretty good understanding of what our top 10 preseason uh, team strength power rankings will be. So uh, we will dig into that in just a little bit. But first, uh, if you are unfamiliar with Campus to Canton, it is a college fantasy football company playing the C2C format. It encompasses both college and NFL players. Uh, you can learn much more about it at campustocanton.com, where uh, memberships start at $2.99 per month. We've got a wide range of content available on the site. That includes uh, quite a few tools, uh, written content. We, of course, have access to the C2C Discord, which is a great place to uh, find a league, a C2C league, a, a college fantasy football league, um, and also uh, meet and discuss a wide range of topics uh, with folks who are interested in, in those types of things. And if you're like me and you could use all the help that you can get on the NFL side of things, uh, check out Nighthawks Dynasty Stock Watch post free agency running backs and receiver write ups. Both of those were uh, put up on the site late last week. Um, and uh, we are uh, always, uh, you know, churning out a, podca a podcast content shows on the Campus to Kent YouTube channel. So again, uh, do subscribe there. Uh, do help us out by liking this video uh, and join uh, campustocanton.com for as little as $2.99 per month. Or uh, you can uh, join at the highest levels, the all 22 and C2C winning edge tiers get you access to uh, those team profiles. As we discussed, our 2023 team profiles are still being updated with injury news and uh, things of, of that sort. Also, you know, color coded to indicate who's coming back, who's not uh, from last season. But if you want the most in-depth information on that sort of thing, uh, our 2024 returning production database is uh, available to all of our uh, C2C Winning Edge and all 22 members. So we've got individual team, team pages for all 134 FBS teams. Try to keep uh, that up to date as much as possible with uh, transfer news, who's going out, who's coming in, who's graduated, moved on to the NFL, things like that. And of course, our members uh, really help us to stay on top of that best we can. We we dig into all the news and information as we uh, are able, but, you know, 134 teams out there, um, and they're certainly, uh, our members are, are very smart, very sharp, very in tune. Uh, so if we miss something, they, they let us know, and, and we try to uh, make that uh, as close to accurate as possible. But uh, what you may be here for today, and, and yeah, we are five months uh, from the official kickoff to the 2024 college football season. So uh, there is plenty of time. We still have a whole you know, new transfer window uh, that could absolutely uh, change 
how these rankings uh you know look <laughs> once all is said and done and of course we haven't even published these yet so this is this is definitely a sneak peek uh but uh you know based on uh, or or prior to any additional transfer news injuries that may happen in uh spring camp or even fall camp because these do get updated based on uh, player injuries and, and things of that nature. Uh, we are built in our uh, CFP Winning Edge team profiles to adjust to you know who is projected to be a starter, uh, who is uh, expected to uh, miss time. Um, any other unforeseen changes? If we get some late breaking uh, coaching news, we do have a coach rating that impacts um, our, our team power rankings. Uh, but as of right now, and this, if this is your first time joining us, uh, the CFB Winning Edge uh, team profiles and our team strength power rankings, we have individual player ratings that are built on uh, recruiting information adjusted for experience and production. Uh, all those player ratings are combined into position ratings and unit ratings that give us an overall roster strength rating. We combine that with a team performance rating, which is how well a team actually played, you know, stats based on the, uh, you know, on the field. How well did that team uh, perform last season or in the preseason? We do a, a three-year weighted team performance window. Also, our head coach, ratings are uh, those team performance ratings specific to each head coach. Um, and, and so those are factors in there as well. But cutting to the chase a little bit about eight minutes in, uh, you know, we, we won't do the, the drum roll countdown from 10 to one. If you've joined us before, you may know that, uh, you know, Ohio State, is is somewhat surprisingly because Georgia is is highly likely to be uh, you know the number one preseason team I would imagine in the Associated Press top twenty five also uh, most likely in the coaches poll uh, they're number one in ESPN's SP plus a wide range of others uh, as well and I'm not saying that that we're right and they're wrong have I have absolutely no idea. You know, I, I focus on uh, just what our numbers say and the way we calculate it. And a large piece of it is uh, that roster strength number where Ohio State, as of right now, in our early ratings, just has an edge over Georgia. So uh, Ohio State right now, as it stands, uh, looks like they're going to be our preseason number one team. Um, Georgia is number two but as of right now we'd have ohio state as as uh more than a one point favorite on a neutral field so uh perhaps a surprise to some but as of right now georgia ranks number four in that uh roster strength rating ohio state ranks number one so that's a, a big big piece of it even though uh georgia has an edge in our uh you know coaches ratings and and things like that um there there's just you know, the talent on the field and, and some of that being uh, experience based because Georgia just has a little bit to replace uh, a little more to replace on the defensive side of the ball gives the Buckeyes a, a little bit of an edge early on. Uh, number three is uh, Texas in our uh, preseason ranking. No, excuse me. Sorry. I was looking at the, uh, I was going to compare these to the national title odds. Number three is actually Oregon uh, in our rankings. Um, Oregon and Texas, very, very close to one another. Texas is number four right now in our, our uh, preseason uh, power rankings, but Oregon uh, does get the slight edge. Oregon just graded out incredibly, incredibly well last season uh, in those team performance numbers. Uh, Dan Lanning comes in you know, not a not a huge sample size as a head coach, but has quickly uh, built uh, you know quite a, a solid head coach rating. Has had very good uh, teams on the field, back to back years. Certainly, some missed opportunities um, at, at times, but last season, um, you know, Oregon. I know there were other analytics folks who who had Oregon uh, at or near number one at the end of last season in their power rankings. We were certainly. Um, Similar, Oregon was number two in our final uh, team strength power rankings last season, ahead of a Washington team that beat it twice. So, you know, 
does again perhaps uh our, our methods are imperfect and they absolutely are but uh, we've got a pretty good track record we've discussed as well as far as how our projections uh you know fare in in projecting point spreads and how uh, they grade out against the spread and, and things like that but um oregon number four or excuse me number three texas uh number four but uh very close and and so you know can you imagine uh all of those teams being in the mix for a college football playoff spot absolutely uh you know semifinal uh runs i think are, are definitely uh in the expectation for those oregon and texas both entering new conferences throws a little bit of a, a different wrinkle into uh the mix because you know facing a new selection of teams both um you know uh, from a week to week standpoint it's going to get a little bit tougher um just uh, you know body blows one week after the other uh very little breathing room for for either teams i'm particularly interested to see how Oregon fares late in the season. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, these power rankings are just a starting point who would be favored against who on a neutral field. Um, they don't factor uh, strength of schedule into the mix. We'll have some more, you know, as we get closer to the season, we'll be able to compare how these teams stack up in projected uh, win totals. You know, that, that of course, will be a uh, week by week strength of schedule focused uh, factor there. But um, at least as of right now, how they stack up on paper and in our spreadsheets, uh, we've got Ohio State number one, Georgia number two, uh, Oregon number three, uh, just slightly over Texas, uh, who is number four. And rounding out the top five for us is Notre Dame. Uh, a team that we will talk about a little bit later today. Um, Notre Dame, that, that was a little bit of a surprise for me, but our our ratings uh, systems are high on the Fighting Irish. Think that, you know, Riley Leonard coming in, there's not going to be uh, a huge drop off, if any, uh, compared to Sam Harton at the, the quarterback position last year, even though um, there are certainly uh, lots of new faces who are going to be uh, primary performers at the running back position and the wide receiver position. Um, the offense looks like it's going to be good enough, a, a top 20 unit in roster strength, but the defense right now grades out incredibly, incredibly well. Uh, the defensive line is uh, a top three unit we're expecting as far as our position strength goes uh there are four total players three of them are defensive linemen but four total players right now who uh have a 100 or better uh individual player rating so again if this is your first time with us those individual player ratings think of them like a uh madden rating or or you know the, the ea sports uh, college football 25 rating However, we don't cap it at 99. We do allow it to go up and over 100 to give us a little bit more of an indication of, of who are the best of the best players and teams. Um, and Notre Dame has some of the best of the best uh, defenders, especially in that uh, you know front seven uh, defensively. A lot of experience on the back uh, in, in the, the starting secondary, um, the starting five back there, multiple starters, multiple um, experienced transfers coming in. Uh, but that defense for Notre Dame as of right now stacks up really, really quite well and looks like a top five team. There's a a little bit uh, of a uh, maybe not a full tier break, but to me there there's a little bit of a, a separation I think between that you know top four maybe top five uh, and then the the back half of uh, this top 10 because Ole Miss is a team that you know comes in uh, number six they're actually third in our SEC power rankings remembering of course that Texas is now uh, in the mix there um, but just because of the the schedule when I think of okay who's actually going to be able to navigate um, you know uh, an undefeated regular season or 11 and one Maybe this is just a bias on on my end, but for me, it just seems tougher for an Ole Miss to do it than a Notre Dame or even a Texas or or Georgia. Um, but uh, this this Ole Miss team uh, right now stacks up incredibly incredibly well from a roster strength 
standpoint. As of right now, Ole Miss looks like they're going to rank number two in overall roster strength. They look like they are going to be number one in offensive roster strength. Um, there's just no no weak spot on uh, the roster. Maybe you could argue the offensive line is is not uh, elite, certainly, um, but you know, with three incoming transfers uh, expected to start going in with two returning starters, um, they added, you know, more depth. There's there's more than just the three transfers coming in. There's there's four total, uh, plus Micah Pettis, a, a former uh, starter, is uh, back and healthy. So, you know, three returning starters, four incoming transfers who are going to be in the mix of start. I think that that, that unit's going to have uh, quite a bit of uh, depth and, and will end up you know, coming together quite well. The the defense, which has even more new faces, so it can be a little tricky uh, to see, especially if a player, um, you know, is is coming in, transferring from a, a group of five school. Uh, Ole Miss has done this quite a bit in the secondary the last couple of years, uh, getting some experienced players who, according to our way of calculating it, are able to improve that individual player rating uh, because of the production that they put up. Um, uh, it, it, there's the potential that perhaps a couple of players maybe are a little bit overrated. We're trying to work through that. Um, but uh, still, Ole Miss, despite being a team that ranked you know 48th in defensive team performance last season, so not what we would expect from a national championship uh, contending type team or SEC championship team, um, they're still top five right now in defensive roster strength. So um, I'm very, very curious to see if uh, Ole Miss, which really seems like they have been gearing up to really, really make a run this year, uh, especially with those transfer portal additions. Uh, they're going to be a fun team to watch. And I think legitimately, you know, uh, even though maybe for me, it's it's a little difficult to wrap my mind around Ole Miss being a national championship contender, they stack up very, very well uh, the way we calculate it. Penn State right now, number seven in our uh, expected preseason power rankings, uh, likely to be top 10 in overall roster strength, top 10 in offensive roster strength. Uh, the change in offensive coordinator uh, is, uh, I think, a positive one. Um, you know, Nicholas Singleton and, and Katron Allen, uh, one of the top running back duos in college football, certainly a defense that ranked number two last season in defensive team performance. They're taking a little bit of a step back as far as roster strength goes, probably going to be more like a top 20, top 25 uh, unit in terms of that roster strength. Uh, but defensively, Penn State, and yeah, they do have to replace defensive coordinator Manny Diaz as well. But um, this this Penn State team stacks up uh, like a playoff contender and, uh, you know, one of the top uh, contenders in the Big Ten to Ohio State and Oregon, certainly. Uh, number eight for us is Florida State. And, you know, we all know how the season ended uh, for FSU, but uh, last year, regular season, undefeated run, uh, ACC champions gutted it out through the quarterback uh, injuries. Um, and, uh, you know, this year, certainly new faces again, quarterback DJ Uyungle, uh at running back and wide receiver might be relying on uh, some first year transfers as we discussed on Friday. Uh, but right now, FSU looks like a top 10 team on the offensive side of the ball as far as roster strength goes. Uh, defensively, there are uh, a few more question marks, only four full-time starters returning. Um, they did add a, a lot of uh, incoming transfers. Right now, we've got two penciled in to start on the defensive line, uh, but there are two others on the defensive line in the two deep, uh, one linebacker, two in the secondary. So that FSU defense, which right now ranks outside the top 30 in roster strength defensively, um, still, I think, has the potential to play like a top 10, top 15 unit like they were last year. But at least as of right now, looks like the offense probably uh, a little bit ahead of uh, Florida State uh, defense as, as far as those roster strength numbers go. But FSU, if you uh, we're following along is our highest rated ACC team as of right now. So expecting them to, to be the favorite to repeat uh, as conference champs. Number nine, this was a little bit of a surprise for me. Uh, you know, I, I think that our, our top uh, eight 
not not very much different from the you know way too early power rankings that we talked about on the CFP Winning Edge podcast back in January. Um, it it you know with some minor exceptions fell uh, pretty close to this, um, but I did not expect Oklahoma to be a top ten team. I didn't expect Oklahoma to come in ranked ahead of Alabama, um, and it is just by the the smallest smallest of margins that OU is number nine for us right now compared to Alabama, which is number 10. Um, But uh, again, this is how it, you know, stacks up on paper and Oklahoma is a team that, um, you know, graded out as a top 10 team as far as our team performance ratings last season, top 15 defense, top 25, or excuse me, top 15 offense, top 25 defense. They do have to replace Dylan Gabriel at quarterback, but Jackson Arnold, you know, put up big numbers in uh, the uh, bowl game. Uh, should be a smooth transition there. I'm a little concerned about the offensive line. It doesn't grade out particularly well, uh, or, or you know, it, it doesn't project super super well right now. They're going to be relying again on at least three transfers likely to start. Um, but this this Oklahoma uh, offense. Still with that little bit of a question mark, uh, ranks top 25 in our preseason roster strength, but the defense really could be the strength of this team. They rank number four right now, as we expect, in uh, defensive roster strength um, with a lot of experience, especially in the back seven. And of course, Danny Stutzman, the headliner, uh, but a secondary that that could rank um, among one of the best in college football. Uh, right now, it looks like they're number two in our DB uh, position strength ratings. The back seven ranks number one. Um, it's too early to say if they'll be able to hold on to that. But as of right now, that that Oklahoma defense and that that back end, uh, back seven, uh, really, really looks like a, a major, major strength, uh, the way we calculate it on paper. So some of the teams that just missed out of the top 10, and again, it's early. There will be transfer updates. There will be adjustments to projected depth charts. There are some teams that we haven't finished their team profile yet. You know, we're still five, six weeks away uh, from publishing. So, you know, could a, a, a team that we haven't gotten to yet sneak in uh, to the top 10? It, it's pretty unlikely, quite honestly. Tried to tried to go ahead and, and knock out all the teams that we thought really could uh, make a run at a top 10 preseason spot prior to uh you know uh, revealing this top 10 don't want to leave out any any obvious teams but uh some that that came up just short lsu and michigan right now are 11 and 12 louisville um is a team that really really and it's it's transfer heavy but uh, the roster just just really doesn't have uh any major weaknesses on it right now clemson and missouri round out our top 15 uh miami is is definitely in the mix usc texas a&m utah we are a little lower on utah than i expected arizona as well um but all of those teams uh, you know certainly i think have the potential to improve upon their preseason ranking one with some transfer additions coming in, but also um, once, once the games get going, that's, that's definitely uh, part of it. This, this way we calculate it changes based on new information all the time. And so uh, this top 10 is, is how it looks right now. And it is unofficial of course, because we're still four or five weeks away from uh, publishing our, our uh, team strength power rankings in full. Uh, But as of right now, Uh, That's who we expect to be on our uh, preseason top 10. Transitioning here to a little bit more of our our normal discussion, uh, what's been going on in in spring practices, and unfortunately at Georgia specifically, Notre Dame as well, as we'll get to in a little bit, but some bad news. Uh, Trevor Etienne, the running back transfer coming over from our tribal Florida, uh, was arrested early Sunday morning uh, for charges, including DUI. Uh, so not a not a good situation, certainly from a 
pure football standpoint, according to Seth Emerson of the Athletic Georgia Policy, typically calls for a one-game suspension for any DUI, uh, DUI arrest, but uh, of course it can be longer if the team or athletic department decides. Uh, Georgia, of course, opens uh, its 2024 season uh, against Clemson in Atlanta on August 31st. Uh, prior to this news, Owen Warden of the Red and Black, the student newspaper, uh, noted that on Thursday at practice, ETN uh, was leading the running back groups through drills. Cash Jones and Roderick Robinson were, uh, you know, uh, two and three in, in some order behind him. Of course, Branson Robinson not participating this spring as he recovers from injury, but expect that he will be in the mix, uh, you know, in that, that group uh, as well once he is back and fully healthy. It was notable to me that, you know, former C2C, uh, favorite. Uh, Andrew Paul right now, the redshirt sophomore, is fourth in running back drills. Uh, and freshman Chauncey Bowens is uh, there with him as well, fifth in the group. Um, Paul, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, chatter that perhaps uh, he is on his way out. Something to note there. Maybe a change of scenery would be good for his long-term future. Uh, hopefully he'll get you know back and fully healthy. That's just something we haven't seen yet uh, so far in his career. Uh, there was a note from Warden that Michael Jackson III uh, appears to be among the, you know, if not starters, uh, you know, top four, perhaps rotating in with the number ones. It is, of course, worth noting uh, that Colby Young, the transfer from Miami, has been limited uh, due to injury. But uh, as Warden noted, Jackson is working alongside uh, fellow senior Dominic Lovett, uh, both uh, lining up behind Arian Smith and Dylan Bell, who are getting number one reps this spring. Uh, in most cases, Landon Humphreys, London Humphrey, excuse me, the transfer from Vanderbilt, um, is uh, working behind Young and uh, with freshman uh, Sokovi White. Uh, Ra Ra Thomas and Anthony Evans are also uh, in the mix as well in that, you know, top top two group uh, of, of wide receivers in that top six. Um, uh, transitioning here to Texas, a uh, few notes from late last week and over the weekend, Eric Nalen of Inside Texas uh, noted that there was an intense Saturday practice uh, in Austin. He credited that to be one, the, you know, going going full pads after getting things started uh, with the first couple of practices last week. But also, uh, Texas was hosting uh, high school coaches from across, you know, the Texas High School uh, Football uh, Association. So uh, in part due to uh, that and, and then, of course, ramping up the intensity with uh, going full pads. And there were, according to Nalen, three live periods of tackling to the ground uh, on Saturday it was was a, a pretty intense uh, atmosphere. Um, Nalen passed along some notes from a source of his, uh, either on the team or, or close to it, because there there is a little less uh, media access at Texas uh, than some of the, the teams that were able to get more in-depth news uh, and notes from. Uh, but he said that uh, Isaiah Bond and Jonte Cook both look really good. The source said, quote, Bond is the real deal. Um, Ryan Wingo also uh, apparently running with the first team offense, uh, at least on occasion, but true freshman there, uh, Ryan Wingo. So uh, an indication of what the staff thinks for him. And according to this source behind the scenes, uh, head coach Steve Sarkeesian is uh, quite complimentary of Wingo. Uh, unsurprisingly, Quinn Ewers looking good this spring, it sounds like. Uh, he was described as, quote, precise on Saturday. Uh, on Friday, Nalen, along with uh, some input from Justin Wells, also of Inside Texas, uh, said that DeAndre Moore Looks good in the slot. Uh, he's getting a lot of reps there while Silas Bolden, the transfer from Oregon State, uh, is still in Southern California. Uh, Jonte Cook is working on the outside. Um, it sounds like, uh, according again, the source says uh, was up front with how important this point in time is for Moore because Cook, Bolden, Bond, 
uh, and Golden all are able to play the slot. So uh, see if, if Moore's going to take advantage of the opportunity he's got right now uh, to establish himself. Uh, Ewers, again, confidence an all-time high, uh, looking more and more uh, like a real leader on the team through the first two practices. Uh, Arch Manning, though, of course, right there. Uh, would win a lot of games if he were the starter, uh, Texas would, um, but uh, apparently has been very accurate, hasn't missed very many throws so far this spring. Chip Brown of Horns 247 last week added some notes uh, on other offensive skill position players, including uh, freshman tight end Jordan Washington, who, quote, uh, is further along than we expected. Also, uh, you know, quoting a, a source there. Um, and then uh, Jadon Blue, uh, the running back, uh, Steve Sarkeesian said, quote, Jaden Blue is a guy who's really grown up uh, in year three in the program. So fewer details on, you know, what's going on on the field there, perhaps, but uh, a lot of positive news and reports uh, from from uh, a lot of players stepping up into to bigger roles this year for uh, that top five preseason team, according to our numbers, top four. Um, and, and, you know, the only group uh, in that that top four who was a uh, college football playoff participant last year. So uh, Notre Dame, also uh, some bad news. Uh, Tyler Horka of Blue Gold was among the reporters who uh, were there for uh, Marcus Freeman uh, mentioning to the press late last week that uh, quarterback Riley Leonard had another surgery on Friday to address the stress fracture in his foot. Um, he will be out for most, if not all, of spring. Um, and this is the same foot slash ankle uh, that was previously operated on last year. So uh, Riley Leonard, of course, the starting quarterback at Duke, was injured against Notre Dame. Uh, that injury, it sounds like, has not you know, he's not been back and, and fully 100% was practicing uh, this spring. But whether it's a re aggravation or, or something that um, uh, just, you know, uh, kind of popped up, got worse, uh, Riley Leonard taking him off the field, had surgery, uh, hoping to get back and, and fully healthy. So uh, Marcus Freeman said uh, here, quoting Horka, uh, uh, or excuse me, reading Horka's quotes of Freeman. Uh, quote, Riley Leonard will be out a few weeks due to an additional surgery he had on his ankle on Friday to address a stress fracture that was beginning to develop. Basically, the surgery was to exchange the current plate he had in his ankle with a new one. The doctors thought it went extremely well. The, oversaw, the overall prognosis and health of his ankle is excellent. So we'll see when he can get back. We're not putting a timetable. Uh, we know it's going to be a few weeks. We're not saying he's out for the spring. There could be a chance he comes back and participates in some capacity during spring ball. Personally, I wouldn't expect it. Might as well just give him the time, fully rest, uh, let Steve and Jelly, who's going to be getting most of those number one reps at quarterback uh, with Leonard out, you know, let him handle that in the spring game, which of course is April 20th. Um, and then of course, you know, Kenny Mincy, maybe a few more reps for freshman CJ Carr as well. But Riley Leonard is, is, uh, I mean, arguably the most important factor, uh, for Notre Dame this season mentioned how good the defense is and that'll, that'll take them a long way. Uh, but Riley Leonard offensively, uh, it, it, you know, they're going to need him if they are going to capitalize on that top five potential, uh, that at least our numbers, say that Notre Dame has. Uh, a few other notes from elsewhere in college football. At LSU, Will Nickel of Tiger Rag uh, was uh, at hand. Uh, there was a, a full open practice on Saturday. So uh, LSU at different points this season has given, you know, 15 minute windows, 20 minute windows to media. Uh, on Saturday, apparently it was open season. Uh, everybody could uh, watch. And according to Nickel, it was, we're always keeping tabs, we're, what's the wide receiver group, right? Kyron Lacey uh, and Chris Hilton, always, it seems like, are uh, number one wide receivers. Aaron Anderson, 
was the third of that uh, starting group on Saturday. Uh, Nichols said that Lacey had a standout play uh, when he snagged an underthrown ball off a defender's helmet for a touchdown catch. So uh, not necessarily great there that's hitting the defender in the helmet, but Lacey making the best of it. Uh, after the, the practice, uh, Coach Kelly said, according to Nickel, quote, uh, I've seen a big change in the way he, talking about Lacey, approaches practice. It's so different than what it was last year. I think he was the third man, and he's not that now, and he handles himself that way. Uh, incoming transfers, CJ Daniels and Xavier Thomas still rotated some with uh, the first team. It is worth noting, even though they're not out there with that first group, um, uh, you know, they were still getting some number one rep. So worth noting there. Uh, Shay Dixon of the Bengal Tiger, Tiger, excuse me, uh, noted a few things, quite a few write ups of uh, how the secondary uh, is taking shape. Of course, they're installing a new defense at LSU uh, and a lot of, of uh, you know, returners in the defensive backfield, the cornerback position, getting some guys healthier uh, is a big part of it. But how are the safeties and the new star position? How's that all working out? So uh, Dixon gave a, a great in-depth, uh, you know, some insight into that uh, over the weekend. Uh, but one thing that, uh, you know, kind of stuck out to me, we haven't talked very much about the tight end position. So I've been a lot of focus on uh, how much, First of all, how the, the rotation at, at wide receiver is going, uh, but then also the transition to Garrett Nussmeyer at quarterback, the lack of depth behind the top two, uh, only two scholarship running backs. Uh, but at, at tight end, you know, especially uh, thinking about it, all right, first time starter for a full season, Nussmeyer, uh, and a, a wide receiver group in transition. You've got Mason Taylor back at tight end. Uh, there's certainly an opportunity, you think, for him to be, you know, that real security blanket type tight end. If not, just a, an outright playmaker. I'm personally a big uh, fan of Mason Taylor. And and Shea Dixon was, was uh, sounds like, sing, thinking along similar lines. He said, uh, quoting here from the piece, uh, we've said it plenty before, but with the transition at quarterback from Jaden Daniels to Garrett Nussmeyer, the tight ends are expected to get lots of work this season. That likely means Mason Taylor is lining up for his biggest season to date when it comes to production. Uh, Taylor had a solid day on Saturday. While we only got a brief glimpse of second-year tight end Kamarian Pimpton uh, after he beat safety Kylan Jackson for a touchdown in one-on-one -on -one drills uh, before they got heated, it sounds like, and punches were thrown. Uh, so both of those players were kicked out of practice on Saturday. But uh, Mac Markway and five-star freshman Trey Dez Green both uh, arriving this summer. Uh, tight ends, uh, one of the one of the more talented position groups on that LSU roster, and could be a real asset to this team. Texas A&M also uh, kicked off practice late last week, and we, uh, you know, not a, not a whole lot of uh, newsy news uh, just yet, but uh, among the players that late last week, new head coach Mike Elko said uh, would be out or extremely limited this spring, uh, offensive lineman Cam Dewberry, uh, as well as Aki Agunbiyi uh, and Bryce Foster, who is with the track team. Um, defensive ends Shamar Turner and Anai White are both going to be out, and then tight end Donovan Green still recovering from that uh, torn ACL. Uh, it was notable from that Thursday press conference, Mike Elko, uh, you know, uh, of course we want to know who's lining up where, who's taking first team reps, who's not. Uh, that's a lot of what we do here. We also spend, uh, try to, you know, every every few episodes say, as much as we want to know this information, let's not read too much into how guys line up in you know, practice number one of the spring. There's so much time, so many things can change. And, and Mike Elko wanted to really echo that. But he specifically said, <laughs> according to uh, Cardinal Carroll's of Gigam 247, uh, the media will not be able to figure out his depth chart. So instead of speculating on the depth chart, Carroll's noted, you know, who who was uh, with that first group where Connor Wegman was the quarterback. Uh, he also did note running back 
Reuben Owens II was the first running back there with Wegman. The wide receivers in that group were Moose Muhammad III, Noah Thomas, and John A. Walker. The tight end was Theo Malin Ostrom. Le'Veon Moss was second among running backs. Amari Daniels was third. Uh, and at wide receiver with the second group, Cyrus Allen, John Bray Barber, and Micah Teese uh, rounded out that group. Uh, Wegman, uh, according to Carol's report, said, uh, or, or Wegman did not seem to have any obvious limp or physical limitation. So that is a good sign. Uh, however, uh, during the period that the media was able to view uh, on that first practice last week, the quarterbacks were not throwing against defenses or moving around very much. Uh, Mike Elko was quoted by uh, Cole Thompson of all Aggies uh, going into uh, the spring practice uh, period last week, talking about Wegman said he's still battling. He'll be out there practicing. I don't think he's exactly where he'd like to be long term. Not that he's behind or anything or hasn't done what he's supposed to do or there's concerns. I think obviously he would like to be a little bit healthier. He'll be able to work efficiently as a pocket passer. I don't know how well he'll uh, he'll be able to truly run around yet. He still hasn't quite fully uh, out there doing agility work and those types of things. It's important for us to get him out there and get him integrated in the system. So uh, Wegman practicing, but if you hear any of uh, you know reports, oh he he looked bad uh, today. Uh, maybe maybe it's because he's just not exactly fully up to speed uh, quite yet health-wise. All right, a few other news and notes from elsewhere. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Patrick Brown of Go Balls 247 had uh, some notes on uh, the wide receiver position. Uh, Dante Thornton is back and healthy. Brew McCoy is not yet. Uh, there's a lot of competition, but one thing that stood out to Brown, that, which caught my eye as well, he noted, uh, Squirrel White and Caleb Webb look crisp on their routes, and their experience in this offense shows up compared to a newcomer like Chris Brazel the second, the transfer from Tulane. There's a lot of high hopes for it. We've got him penciled in uh, in our team profiles uh, for Tennessee and that projected uh, depth chart, the, the projected starters for Tennessee. Definitely think that he is uh, going to be in that you know top group. Uh, but here, according to Brown, reading from the piece, the Tulane transfer is a long strider who quickly eats up yards, but you can tell he's still going through an adjustment period. After Webb ran a picture-perfect option route where he broke over the middle, Brazel rushed his break to the outside after wide receivers coach Kelsey Pope, mimicking a defensive back, showed inside leverage. Brazel then got coached up by Pope, who reminded him to show a little more hesitation to freeze the defender and give himself an advantage. So, again, we're not going to over, uh, you know, we're not going to worry too much about who took the first rep in practice number one. We're not going to worry too much about one rep in one receiver drill where a guy's lined up against his position coach and, and not, you know, a defender. Uh, but when there's a little note like that, it's just, just something to, to file away that, okay, you know, Brazel is expected to step in day one, be a starter, be a major impact player in a very prolific uh, offense. But, you know, with his situation transferring in from Tulane, he's still relatively young, a third year sophomore. Um, perhaps, you know, we should keep our expectations a little bit in check early on uh, as he makes an adjustment. Uh, Brown noted also quarterback Nico Iamaleva, uh, who is noticeably bulked up in his upper, upper body compared to last year. Uh, sounds like he is looking sharp early in spring practice. No surprise there. Uh, but um, sounds like he is also, you know, mentioned Quinn Ewer showing more leadership. Uh, Nico Yamaleva uh, also uh, getting uh, high praise uh, for his leadership, pulling aside teammates, getting on the same page with receivers, uh, things like that. So, uh, any you know, not not necessarily the most actionable information, but good to note as somebody who is uh, you know now in his second year of the system and is taking over that prolific uh, offense uh, at the quarterback position. Speaking of, at North Carolina, Cade Shoemaker of the Daily Tar Heel noted uh, that 
of course, with Drake May moving on to the NFL draft, uh, there is a uh, competition at quarterback to replace him as of right now. Connor Harrell getting uh, first team snaps ahead of Max Johnson. Uh, sounds like you know neither was perfect in uh, the practice that Shoemaker was able to attend. Uh, Harrell uh, sounded like had a little bit of uh, struggles with timing, pocket presence, things like that, areas where Max Johnson looked a little better, but Harold perhaps uh, had a, a little bit of an edge as far as his accuracy. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, at Syracuse, Aiden Singh of the Juice Online uh, had a, a pretty interesting quote from uh, Syracuse defensive coordinator Elijah Robinson after uh, the second practice of the spring, talking about incoming quarterback Cal McCord, uh, who said, uh, talking about McCord here, is the best I've been around with the throws he makes. He will challenge us every day, and that is going to make us better for the game. So I'm glad that we're going up against him instead of on Saturday. So, you know, uh, McCord was the the starting quarterback of course at Ohio State last year, our preseason number 1 team. It sound it seems like early on. Um but he's now the the you know guy at Syracuse in part because uh it it was a little bumpy at, at Ohio State. Um but Elijah Robinson, who was at uh, Texas A&M last season, was the interim head coach after Jimbo Fisher was dismissed. Uh, so he's he's uh, you know been around some quality quarterbacks. Uh, and says Cal McCord is the best that he's been around. So uh, interesting, interesting note because there are definitely some folks in and around Columbus who uh, uh, have have been around better. <laughs> they they would say uh, at, at uh, tight end, uh, Aronde Gadsen, who of course suffered a season-ending ankle injury last season, was back for the start of spring practice. Um, uh, there's a, a note here from uh, Brent Axe of the the Syracuse Post and Syracuse.com um, said, like McCord was in the front of the quarterback stretch line, so too was Gadsden for the tight ends, uh, right in front of Dan Villari, who was a multi-positional uh, factor at the end of last season for Syracuse, converted quarterback early in his uh, career, but um, is that number two tight end? And there's been plenty of discussion in CFF circles. Is Aronde Gatson a real tight end? Uh, or is he uh, you know, really a, a wide receiver masquerading at tight end? And that position itself, of course, is evolving. Uh, but at least as far as the drills go and, and you know, stretching and whatever, Gatson working out with Villari in that, you know, they're one and two at that tight end. Group. Uh, Gatson did speak to reporters after practice one. Henry O'Brien of the Daily Orange student newspaper was on hand for that. Uh, said, quote, I still have some more things and procedures I got to go through, and that'll be coming up in the next month or two to get back to 100%. So Gatson is out there and practicing, but by his own admission, not yet. 100 percent uh there were some positive notes from uh georgia wide receiver transfers jackson weeks and z haynes uh both of whom are emerging as potential starters it sounds like gadson uh quoting here uh, about those two said i've been on the field with him uh specifically haynes talking about here who uh has made some highlight plays i've uh, been on the field with him so i haven't really seen him at the same time as me but from what i'm seeing z cut a touchdown at the end of practice this Meeks, I don't think he lost the rep all day. Uh, so it's looking like we're going to be dangerous. Uh, also, Axe uh, tweeted out some video this morning of Syracuse's practice, uh, including one that highlighted Yesin Willis, the freshman, 6'1", 215, where he said, uh, early prediction, he's going to push LaQuint Allen for time. LaQuint Allen, uh, returning starter at running back, uh, and, and certainly you know, alongside Gadsden, seen as, as uh, maybe the top uh, CFF asset uh, for Syracuse at this point uh, in, in the offseason. But a very, very interesting team to me specifically. All right, a few quick notes at Arkansas, Arizona State, and TCU before we get to Colorado State as our team of the day in the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, Jackson Fuller of the Fort uh, excuse me, Fort Smith Southwest Southwest Times record. That's a mouthful. My apologies. Uh, but Jackson Fuller wrote up, uh, you know, some of the players who are 
uh, making news this spring, and he highlighted Tyrone Broden at wide receiver, uh, who is, you know, the wide receivers, it sounds like, as a group, are having a very strong spring. Davion Dozier, uh, uh, according to Fuller, had a great second week. Isaiah Satinga has a knack for big plays, he says. Andrew Armstrong, the leader, uh, poised for a big season. But this uh, reading here from Fuller's piece, it's Broden who has been quarterback Taylor Green's favorite target, especially in third down drills. Uh, and Broden, if you didn't know, 6'6", big target. Uh, Broden has shown an improved ability to make catches in the middle of the field and is oozing with self-belief after an underwhelming 2023. Uh Fuller passed along a quote from head coach Sam Pittman, who said, quote, Broden just needed confidence. Now he was hurt and he kind of got behind a little bit on learning because of his injury. As you've seen, he's very talented. And at this point in time, I feel really good about our receiving core uh, for uh, or excuse me, uh, Fuller also mentioned Malachi Singleton, um, who perhaps, as of right now, is is inching his way ahead of Jacoby Criswell on that quarterback depth chart uh, behind Taylor Green, who seems like still the overwhelming uh, starter, uh, projected starter, perhaps. Uh, Arizona State, uh, their their projected quarterback starter. Uh, Jaden Rashada is not going to be able to fully participate in spring practice because of a thumb injury, uh, which apparently happened in a non-football capacity, a bit of a, a moving incident, lifting a box, it sounds like, according to uh, Chris Cartman of Sun Devil Source. Uh, Rashada will not take part in any 11-on-11 or 7-on-7 portions of practice this spring. Uh, that begins on Tuesday, by the way. Head coach Kenny Dillingham met with uh, reporters late last week where this news uh, came out. So that means that uh, Trenton Borgo and retro freshman Sam Levitt, the transfer from Michigan State, are uh, the uh, you know, players who are, are going to get those reps or a larger share of those reps uh, this spring. So uh, Rashada sounds like, according to Dillingham, uh, may have a chance to get out by the end of spring ball said, quote, and this is coming from Vincent DeAngelis of Arizona Sports, hopefully by the end of spring ball, he's taken some seven on seven reps and some non-team reps, dipping his toe in the water. Um, but of course, you know, miss, missed opportunity, uh, perhaps for Rashada, who uh, did miss, what, nine games last season due to injury after uh, being the week one starter. Uh, there was also an interesting note to me from Dillingham, who said that uh, he and new offensive coordinator Marcus Arroyo will have, quote, 60-40, 70-30 uh, split when running the offense. Um, at TCU, we mentioned that, uh, uh, gosh, what's his, what's his first name? Hoover uh, is is the last name. <laughs> I, I do at least one of these an episode, right, where, where uh, uh, so many names going through and, and one that I absolutely should know uh slips my mind but as TCU is getting started at spring practice Josh Hoover Josh uh is not going to be there we we mentioned that late last week so practice number 1 Ken Seals, the former uh, Vanderbilt starter, um, uh, was uh, taking those first team reps. Uh, apparently, uh, quite a few receivers had strong starts to their spring, according to Jeremy Clark of Horned Frog Blitz. Uh, Major Everhart made an explosive play. Eric McAllister had some good plays and looked comfortable. Dylan Wright wasn't a full go, so McAllister uh, was able to perhaps get a few more extra reps there. But uh, Jack Besh, according to Clark, might have been the most impressive receiver today. He made several plays and looks 100% healthy. At running back, uh, according to Clark, Cam Cook was explosive. Um, and of course, they won, so not full pads, uh, but uh, said, yes, it wasn't full contact, but it didn't stop him from hitting his lanes fast and creating some big plays running the ball. Also, and this is maybe the more important part, he got a bulk of the first team reps. So uh, Sonny Dykes was complimentary of Cam Cook at the running back position. Trent Battle uh, was third behind uh, Cook and Trey Sanders 
in those uh, running back uh, drills early on late last week in spring practice. So uh, finishing here for our, pat, our uh, last few minutes, Colorado State also uh, just hit the uh, spring practice field. There was a preview from Nathan Wright of the Loveland Reporter Herald late last week where he had some quotes from uh, Jay Norvell, the head coach, who, of course, happy to be back. Uh, quoting here says, it's great to be back on the practice field. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I've been ready to start practicing for about three weeks. If you've never done anything before, you've got to do things differently to get there. And that's been kind of our motto from uh, motto, excuse me, from this off season. We're definitely different. Our coaching staff is different. Our players are different. We've got a little different approach to what we're doing. And I think we're going to see a big difference on the field. So Colorado State coming off a five win season. Uh, some of the, the differences perhaps are uh, experienced players at the running back position who we should see uh, more of a heavy workload. Uh, Kobe Johnson returns. He was uh, limited to, uh, you know, uh, took a red shirt last season after emerging as a starter. Avery Morrow, who had some off the field issues that he was navigating last year. Both of those players, both graduates in, in their final year, uh, were back uh, on the practice field on Thursday, taking reps, uh, redshirt freshman Justin Marshall and junior Van Scheid, also who got experience last year, were there in that deep running back group. Uh, receiver, of course, Tori Holton. Uh, Horton is back. He's one of the highest. I mean, I think we mentioned when we did our individual uh, you know, video game ratings to the wide receiver position, we expect Horton to be maybe the top rated wide receiver the way we calculate it coming into this year, but of course, Justice Ross Simmons and Mackay Fox are also back. Uh, Donovan Ollie, a transfer from Washington State, is going to be in the mix, as well as one of the highest rated recruits, uh, four-star, according to some, uh, Jordan Ross, who will be enrolling this summer. Uh, quarterback Brandon Fowler Nocolosi back as the full-time starter uh, was quoted here from Nathan Wright saying, uh, talking about spring, the spring practice, uh, it's incredibly important. This is the offseason where I'm looking to make that jump from being that young, immature kid to being a leader on the team and a leader on the field to kind of command the game. This offseason is huge for me. We're ready to make that jump as a team. We're ready to grow out of that immature phase. And we've developed the standard. We understand what we want. So Colorado State is a team that uh, the way we calculate things at, at CFP Winning Edge uh, has, has always graded out pretty highly among group of five teams in uh, those roster strength numbers. I don't have their full team profile done yet, but I would expect uh, that would be similar this year. And there certainly are you know, some, some key pieces that uh, Norvell and his staff will have to replace, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball where Mohamed Kamara is gone off to the NFL. He was a 100-plus rated player. Um, but the secondary looks like it's going to be very experienced. And then a lot of those offensive skill positions, I mean, Horton, another you know 100-plus player. Uh, Ross Simmons is a returning starter. Uh, starter. Uh, Fowler Nicosi as well. The offensive line, uh, you know, there as every offensive line does has replaced uh, some experience, two full-time starters in their case, uh, but three full-time starters are back. Um, so we'll see how that, of course, all shakes out. But uh, the offense as a whole, especially with Horton coming back, who was targeted again over 100 times, 134 last season, had 96 catches, 1,100 yards, 36 uh, or excuse me, 96 catches, 1136 yards, and eight touchdowns. Uh, Ross Simmons was the uh, number three player on uh, the team last year because tight end Dallin Holker, of course, had a huge, huge season. Uh, but Ross Simmons, 45 catches, 724 yards, and three touchdowns. Uh, Dylan Goffney is back after you know limited action uh, last season, transferring from SMU, but I think that he perhaps could be uh, a bigger piece of the offense, especially with Lewis Brown transferring out to San Diego State. Goffney had two touchdowns among his 23 catches, nearly 300 yards. Ollie, you know, 
isn't bringing a lot of production from last season with him, but think that he is definitely going to be uh, in the mix there. But that that running back group, as we said, very, very deep. Um, she, uh, Shield, excuse me, led the team last year with 389 yards on the ground and uh, three touchdowns. He was also a pretty good receiver out of the backfield, double-digit catches, 79 yards. Uh, did not have a, a, a touchdown, but uh, he – very much, I think, will still be a factor, even though it sounds like Kobe Johnson, uh, who, again, in four games, limited to 44 carries, 128 yards, one touchdown, uh, of course, has to improve on that 2.9 yards per carry. Every Morrow wasn't much better in his seven games, 3.2 yards per carry, but both of those two back fully healthy, hopefully fully available, most importantly, um, think that they'll be in the mix there. Uh, for starting reps and and you know maybe shield gets some as well maybe justin marshall who had 300 yards and two touchdowns uh could be as well but uh deep deep position there and then fowler nicolsi uh you know threw for nearly 3500 yards last season 22 touchdowns has to of course cut down on those 16 interceptions but that colorado state offense uh they they push the ball down the field even though he only averaged seven and a half yards per attempt uh, over nine yards for average depth of target uh, a couple of years ago if you remember tory horton you know was was targeted just an insane number of times but a lot of those were very very short this past year you had an a dot of uh, uh double digits 10.2 according to pff so um imagine that 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 will continue uh not only is he going to get a large a uh, number of targets if back and fully healthy, which was a little bit of an issue last year, especially down the stretch. Um, hopefully he'll be used to, to stretch the field as well. Uh, but on, you know, defense, and I, I skipped over you know, all those players coming back on offense, uh, Colorado State ranks 37th in our adjusted offensive returning production numbers at CFB Winning Edge, and, and our uh, C2C Winning Edge tier members can can dig into those numbers deeper. On the defensive side of the ball, a little lower, but still you know, roughly FBS average. They're 69th in adjusted returning production. Uh, three of the top four starters, uh, excuse me, tacklers, three of the top four tacklers are back. Defensive back, Jack Howell. Linebacker, Chase Wilson. Defensive back, Henry Blackburn. Uh, and it looks like seven of the top 10. So, you know, definitely some experience having to replace Kamara is big. He is likely to get drafted. Uh, uh, Chigozi and Newsom, uh, talented and, and productive defensive back as well. Justin Sanchez at linebacker uh, had 87 tackles third on the team. So, you know, replacing one of your key players at each level of the defense is, is not nothing, but Colorado State uh, experience-wise, uh, a, a step in the right direction. The the talent numbers uh, traditionally, and I expect to be the same moving forward. Pretty good stack up. You know, definitely top half, top quarter even of the Mountain West, uh, where you know the the schedule is uh, manageable. They do have uh, a trip to Oregon State. The sort of you know, kind of, sort of, Mountain West uh, Conference team this year. Uh, that is on uh, October 5th. They do get a week off prior to that. Uh, their four non-conference games prior to that point, they start at Texas. So, you know, difficult spot against our preseason number four team uh, there on, on August 31st. But uh, host Northern Colorado in week two. So get back you know, on the, the right side of things in the win column, then host uh, Colorado, uh, where, of course, you know that rivalry got taken up a notch last season with some uh, uh, comments made from Norvell that uh, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, didn't didn't take too kindly to, and, and uh, Shadur Sanders as well, last season. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out with that game returning to Fort Collins this year. Uh, and then UTEP. Really intriguing team to me out of Conference USA uh, is uh, the opponent in week four. Then week off at Oregon State, and then you hit the, the Mountain West schedule. Uh, home against a new-look San Jose State team. 
at Air Force, which always a difficult matchup, but Air Force is dead last in all of our returning production numbers this year. Host New Mexico at Nevada, where there's a little bit of bad blood still between Colorado State and Nevada on how the whole Jay Norvell situation shook out. They do get a week off uh, prior to the uh, final three regular season games where uh, Colorado State will host the border war against Wyoming, take a trip to Fresno State, and then host Utah State in the regular season finale. So uh, last year, CSU went five and seven. I think that, uh, you know, bowl eligibility is the obvious uh, goal. Getting back to a, a winning record is very possible. This Colorado State team, um, I, I think we're going to project them for probably like a seven and five uh, type record, if I were to, to make my best guess now. There is, uh, you know, other than the Texas game, where you say that that's probably a loss, right? Texas is one of the elite teams in college football we expect coming into this year. But um, everywhere else, yeah, there'll be an underdog, I'm sure, against Colorado. Probably going to be an underdog at Oregon State. Um, maybe, you know, at Fresno State could expect there as well. But uh, the the rest of uh, the games on the schedule, if they're not favorites, it'll be probably a toss up, um, at least as far as our, our preseason projections go. And on that note, our preseason projections are, uh, you know, projected win totals where we have a projected point spread for every matchup, every FBS game across all 135 this year teams, because we are throwing that Delaware um, uh, team page in a year ahead of schedule. Those will be available to our All-22 and C2C Winning Edge tier members at CampusCanton.com. When we publish those, May 1st is our goal. That's our target date. Uh, we'll, of course, update that as we get closer. But if you want access to that, uh, become an All-22 or C2C Winning Edge member, uh, and you'll get that as well as our returning production database, which is up and running. You can get all kinds of, of stats and information who's coming back, who's not, transfers in, transfers out, injuries are noted in there, guys who are going to miss the season. Uh, also, we're putting in, you know, added guys who, who missed last season due to injury. So in Utah, for example, you get to see how Cam Rising and Brent Keithy, that coming back impacts the numbers. Uh, but then, of course, you know, if, if you want to just try out uh, campuscanton.com. You can do so for as little as $2.99 per month. Uh, that is going to wrap it up for us today. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to the Campus to Canton YouTube channel. Thank you for liking this video and helping us uh, as we bring this to you three days a week on Good Morning College Football. We'll be back on Wednesday. I'm Nicholas Ian Allen of CFP Winning Edge and campus to Canton.com. Have a great day and uh, we'll see you next time.